So welcome to our town, our town hall style webinar. Um, this is a series, the second in a series of town hall meetings that provide a platform for communities to share their experiences, concerns, and issues related to COVID-19 and the vaccines. The National Reach Coalition would like to thank our partners, the UA Tele Telemedicine Network, the Melanie Zuckerman College of Public Health, the National COVID Resiliency um, <coughs> Network, and um, the American Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical Association, Pharmacists Association, and um, the HOPE Network, the HOPE Promotora Network. Um, so <clears throat> um, we began working with um, the National Reach Coalition is, is that committed to amplifying the voices of community. We began working with communities to provide a platform for them to share their experiences with COVID-19 from the beginning of the pandemic. Today's seminar is one in the NRC's recent series launched last week to have community members and healthcare experts share what's happening with the COVID-19 vaccine in their community. Uh, last week, so, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a um, webinar with uh, the African-American and AAPI communities. Today, um, we're focusing on Latino, Hispanic, and Latinx communities. The next one uh, will focus on American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Um, now I'd like to hand the webinar off to our facilitator, Antoinette Angulo and the panelists. Good afternoon, Antoinette Angulo. And I join you from Seattle, Washington, um, from the lands of the Duwamish uh, tribal and the Salish, the Coast Salish peoples here. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and um, I just wanted to share that um, I've been a part of the, uh, the board for the National Reach Coalition for many years, um, pre-pandemic. Um, so it's an honor to contribute to this webinar and this education opportunity. Um, so I'd like to kick it off um, without further ado and introduce our guests here. Um, first, we'll have Jesenia Melendez, uh, who is a community member representative um, from Atora with the Hope Network of Promotores. Um, Maricopa County. We have three wonderful speakers here for you. And um, before they start sharing, I want to just remind everybody that we have interpretation services here available. Um, if anyone needs interpretation, you just go to the bottom of your screen on the toolbar, click interpretation and, and click Spanish. And since we have um, interpretation services, I'd like to ask everyone, um, our speakers, to um, just pace yourself, please, um, being mindful of our interpreter uh, so that she has a chance to catch up with us. Okay, great. So I will introduce each of the three speakers um, one at a time. And I'm going to ask them to um, introduce themselves a little bit more and then also speak to the most pressing issue or concern in your community. And so each speaker will have about five minutes to do that. And then we'll launch into Q&A and we'll have plenty of time to kind of popcorn questions um, across our panel. So um, I mentioned Jesenia Melendez. She's a promotora with the Hope Network of um, Promotores from Maricopa County, Arizona. Passing the mic to you, Jacenia. Hi, good afternoon. As you mentioned, my name is Jacenia Melendez. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I am working currently with um, Hope Network. Um, I'm part of Hope Network and also a lead over at the Cartwright School District. Um, and we're here to help the community and uh, answer any questions that we may assist with. And of course, guide them in any resources that they might uh, need as well. Great. And can, Jesenia, can you speak a little bit to the most pressing issues or concerns in your communities around COVID-19 or the vaccine? Um, I would say at this point, um, we have a, a little variety of, of what the COVID is. Um, as far as to like the getting vaccinated, um, as we know, vaccine appointments are going quite quickly. Um, and others are just kind of iffy of choosing the proper vaccination as far as to the three different types of vaccines that they could go ahead and um, apply. Um, and it's just answering questions and it's more about the, the facts and not just like the whatever the word to mouth is, you know, as far as to, well, if you get this one, this one might be better than the other one. Um, it's just giving them the proper information and, of course, guiding them 
uh, where they could actually go ahead and um, keep trying to make that appointment to get vaccinated. Great, thank you. And I know we'll have, um, we'll have more time to dig deeper into that. So now I'd like to introduce um, Berta Carvajal, who is a promotora and the founder of the Hope Network of Promotores in Maricopa County, Arizona. Hi, um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be invited and I'm going to share a PowerPoint. So I hope I don't throw everybody off and make a boo-boo here. Um, Chris, you know, let me know. Can you all see it? Hello? Yes, it's working. Okay, perfect. Okay. So- Thank, thank um, you, Berta. And could you put it on presentation of you for us too, please? Excuse me, um, put it on presentation. Yeah, okay, uh, it's I, just that bottom. Up here, up here, I see, I can't find the presentation button. You go to slideshow? Yes. And then from the beginning. Slideshow yes. from the beginning. Okay, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Right there. You're good. Okay, You're good. got it. Okay. From the beginning. Okay, from the beginning. There it is, right there. Okay, so um, helping other promotores excel, that's what the HOPE stands for. And um, we've been, we formalized in 2009, you know, es un, una red para ayudar a otros promotores sobre salir. Um, and the whole focus is to empower our community of community health workers, promotores, whether they're volunteers, you know, or, um, professionals, paraprofessionals. And like every group, we of course have music and we have our, our anthem. Now this is in Spanish, yes, uh, but our anthem uh, is available on YouTube. So if you all wanna make a note of this, maybe Yesenia can put it in the chat. You can go to YouTube and if you uh, type in Promotora Him, then you'll see our um, you'll hear the, the anthem, the promotores, el himno de promotores, and you'll see subtitles in English. And so it basically just, you know, talks about how, like doves, you know, flying, we take information all into our communities, and the whole goal is to empower families and create healthier families. So this slide is in English and Spanish, but... Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Was I just supposed to introduce myself or can I go into this now? Uh, you're doing great, Berta. Okay. And uh, yeah, and speaking to the most pressing issues through the lens of a promotora. Uh, That's right. Okay, so the Hope Network, you know, it's a forum that provides, you know, our community of promotores, you know, an opportunity to, you know, network and to um, collaborate and, and work with, you know, collaborating partners that are in the community. So our promotores are very embedded. You know, we're embedded in the community. So we're the go-to people, you know. Um, it's very simple, you know, we try to keep it very simple. It's an opportunity to empower with education on whatever the issues are affecting our communities. Um, and, and at this time, of course, it's the pandemic, it's the vaccine, you know, to, to get vaccinated or not, to get tested or not. Um, and you know, it's, it's um, we hear it all. Since we're embedded in the community, we're the first ones that our community is going to reach out to and say, you know, um, I heard this, or I, I understand this, you know, because there's a lot of myths and not facts that are, you know, in our communities, and we've heard it all. Um, we just had one of our Hope Network quarterly meetings this past Friday, and we had a doctor present talking about the vaccines and, 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 and answering questions. And, you know, we actually had uh, questions from community members and promotores who have heard this from their community that they didn't want to take the vaccine because they, uh, were told or heard that it contained a fetus. 
you know, um, unborn, you know, that they had utilized and that it contained um, fetus. So again, you know, it's, it's a lot, of, a lot of myth, a lot of fear. If I get vaccinated, I'm going to get, you know, COVID. I'm going to get really sick. It's just like the flu shot. These are the things we're hearing. Um, we're also hearing that, you know, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of shocks us, but we remain calm, you know, because these are real fears, you know, in our community. And the other one is it's this is a government conspiracy. It's a government conspiracy. How is it that the vaccine was, you know, um, was made so fast? you know, and it can't possibly be safe. And it's a conspiracy through the government, you know, because we, you know, the pop they want to get rid of the pop population. They want to, it, it's just, a, it's kind of scary, actually, you know, some of these thoughts and, that are going, that are happening in our community. So, you know, Promotores, the Hope Network focuses on helping our Promotores excel. How? with education, with information, with resources, with training. You know, we we don't want to be ever sharing or relaying uh, the wrong information. We want to learn from the experts. We want to become empowered, you know, with the uh, correct information from the experts and, um, and the professionals, and therefore, you know, have the right resources and information to be able to share within our communities. You know, uh, the pictures that you're seeing, you know, these are all groups of promotores that, you know, we come together, you know, quarterly um, for the past, you know, over 10 years. And then we have uh, in those quarterly meetings, we're providing, you know, the resources and the training from experts, you know, all over, all over Maricopa County. And, and in every issue, health, health, physical, mental, social, you know, um, issue that is affecting our communities. So, you know, we have a, an outstanding, you know, per participation. Um, the promotores, the more informed that they are, the more knowledgeable they are, well, then they can help, you know, clarify those myths and those, um, you know, the misinformation that's happening in our communities. We don't attempt, you know, what we provide our, our community health workers with, we, we let them know, you're not, a, you know, it's not about convincing you're the person, the family, the individual that you're uh, speaking with. It's about, you know, sharing the knowledge and the education and the information that that you have received. And then, you know, um, if you've received the vaccine, you, you know, they may ask you, well, what happened to you? You know what? You know, because I'm asked all the time. Uh, I got my first dose in January. And then in February, my second dose. And, you know, they want to know, how did you feel? What did you, did you have any symptoms? Well, I'm one of those lucky persons, you know, those blessed persons that I did not. Am I going too fast for our translator? I probably am, huh? Sorry. Um, but I was able to, um, you know, I, I didn't get sick. I didn't have any symptoms. And so I share that, you know, um, my experience. But I also let them know, you know, that's my experience. And, um, and, and that always helps, you know, um, because, again, you know, we're the go-to people. We're the ones that uh, nos tienen confianza. You know, they trust us. They, they, they are anxious to hear what our idea is, what our input is. Um, am I good on time? Are we you're, you're great. You still have time if you have more. You'd like to share. Yeah. And so what I've been sharing in this slide is, you know, it, it's an amazing, you know, group of individuals. These are all, you know, individuals, as I mentioned, who volunteer as promotores in their schools, in faith-based or faith-based organizations, block watches, different, you know, uh, groups, as well as 
paraprofessionals that may be working in the school districts, that may be working in a clinic, in a community center, and the professionals, you know, who are, you know, working as community, you know, uh, health workers with uh, Dignity Health, KEO, you know, uh, different health organizations. And, um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful, um, what we see happening in our world of promotores is, is the empowerment that takes place, you know, with knowledge, the growth, both personal, professional, you know, spiritual. I mean, it's amazing. And I personally have witnessed, in, you know, in all these years where I, I remember a specific, you know, community uh, promotores and, and they've grown and become empowered and they become entrepreneurs and they become employed. Um, they go on to take college courses. We provide a, a, a a training for all individuals who are working and who are be and who are uh, utilizing the promotora model. Um, we provide a three to four day training on the core competencies of a promotor because we need to know that it, you know the core competencies you know are very important because we need to discuss and talk about confidentiality the respect of you know hipaa you know and um and and provide all those skills those basic you know core competency skills you know to help every uh individual that's joining the family of promotores you know to be prepared and to be better informed and so they've become i we we even offered, uh, they, we received an opportunity for medical interpret, interpreting, you know, and this is so important because the more training, the more education, and it's the same with the vaccine. The better prepared we are, then we'll be better prepared to share that information with our communities. We hold an annual, an annual event called Dia del Promotor. Um, this uh, this event is an all day event. We usually have close to 150 to 200 who attend. Um, you know, this year obviously we had to do it virtually, which was a new thing, and we still had over a hundred who participated. So um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of need, and so uh, you know, the more the merrier. Now I wear uh, you know multiple hats. Okay, the one that pays the bills is I work with uh, Dr. Kuhn. I'm with ASU, um, the Edson College of Nursing, and I, you know, um, I'm involved in educational research, um, you know, focusing on dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, memory loss, and caregivers and their loved ones. And uh, as a matter of fact, you see the young woman holding the baby, the little girl? That's Yesenia who's at the dentist. <laughs> That's Yesenia, who just spoke a few minutes ago. And, and you know, um, our promotores, the HOPE Network, is a collaborating partner with programs at ASU, you know, with Dr. Kuhn and several other organizations because they see the value and they see the power, the power of, you know, promotores in our community. And, you know, can you tell that I just, you know, I love them to death? Does it show? And we currently have, and here's another, um, you know, our, this was our actual last Promotores Core Competency Training in February of 2020, because then, you know, our world, uh, as we know, knew it, you know, kind of shut down. So we have a waiting list right now uh, for the next, you know, a Core Competency Training. That's my colleague, Lourdes Baez Montes, who is a pioneer, Martha knows, you know, in the promotora movement and training. And um, we love her to death. And she's been able to, you know, offer promotores um, certificates with actual CE, you know, credit hours, uh, nine hours of contact uh, for all the participants. And this is a wonderful thing, you know, for them to um, be encouraged and and motivated to continue their education, their formal education, if they choose to.
This was the last group in February. Thank you, Berta. Uh, thank you for sharing this really energizing and inspiring information about the importance of promotoras and promotores um, as trusted sources and trusted advocates. We uh, received a comment here on the chat that your energy is contagious. How can I meet you? So it will have to be arranged afterwards. But thank oh, yeah. you so much. And we'll keep returning to this theme. Um, okay. For the moment, I want to continue on with um, our next speaker. Thank you. Um, with Sandra Leal. She's a pharmacist and the new president of the American Pharmacists Association. She's a PharmD, MPH, FAPHA, CDCES, uh, and Executive Vice President of Professional Affairs and Sinfonia RX, a THRC solution in Arizona. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I love, Berta, everything that you shared. I, my Actually, my first job in high school in healthcare was as a promotora, a teen promotora. And Marta Monroy, who's here, was my uh, my boss and my mentor for life. And she wrote me a letter of recommendation to get into pharmacy school. So I owe a great deal of gratitude to her. So what you said earlier about how promotoras go on and try to seek new information and you know additional things, um, I can definitely attest to that. So I currently, I'm the executive vice president at Symphony RX, it, it, which is a tabula rasa healthcare solution company. And what we do as a pharmacist, we do um, outreach to patients to try to make sure that they understand their chronic conditions and the multiple medications that they take uh, for things like diabetes and high blood pressure and cholesterol. And we've actually worked with promotoras, pharmacists have worked with the promotoras to create a, a collaboration to work even more effectively together. Because we know as providers, as healthcare providers, that our reach is only so much. Sometimes we stay within the clinic walls and we love to use and collaborate with uh, promotoras that go out physically into the field and work with patients and then figure out ways to work together. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I was installed as president of the American Pharmacists Association, which is incredible um, to me that I'm sitting in this role because pharmacists have really played a significant role in COVID. And so I've been really involved with the role of pharmacists and being able to um, improve the, the dissemination and access of COVID vaccination. So we've been helping a lot with um, distribution, with information, with education, uh, anything that you can uh, imagine as it relates to COVID testing, uh, vaccines, and then just anything that comes through both as the American Pharmacists Association and, and in, the, in the work that we do, which is a lot of it is telehealth. Uh, so we call patients and find out what's going on, what concerns they have with their medication. And we get like 50 questions around COVID. What vaccine should I take? Is it available? Where do I get it? Um, I wanted, I, since you shared slides, Beth, I wanted to share four slides that I had just to show a little bit about the impact and the role pharmacists are playing. So I'll share my screen here. Sandra, as you're right. queuing that, um, just a, a reminder to slow the pace a little bit for our interpreter. Thank you. Okay. So this is something that President Biden said yesterday, and it just goes to show the reach that pharmacists have. So more than 90% of Americans live within five miles uh, of one of these pharmacies. And so there's the chain pharmacies, the ones that you think of like uh, the ones that are in Walgreens or Walmart or CVS. And then we also have independent pharmacies. So these are like the, the privately owned pharmacies that might be one or two stores that an individual might hold. But where you see the darker spots, that's where you see the concentration of pharmacies. And so 90% of Americans live within five miles of that. And pharmacists during the pandemic have been given the authority to also vaccinate children between the ages of three and 18 uh, because a lot of kids have fallen behind on their maintenance and routine vaccines. So not just COVID vaccines, but all those other things. So pharmacists are, are essentially working to try to catch kids up or triage back to the provider so people do not lose that, that care that they should have been receiving during COVID, but people have obviously not been going to their normal appointments like usual. In this slide, the red indicates where there are no pharmacies available. So even though we have a lot of reach, 90% within five miles, there are pockets in the United States where there's not a pharmacy at all, where they have closed down, uh, or for whatever reason, there's counties that don't have that access. And that's very detrimental, especially as you're trying to create access. 
this is the right now currently as of 324 the FEMA supported vaccine centers and you can see where the stars are where they've been concentrated but what's striking about this is that you see that they're mostly in the larger metropolitan areas. They're not necessarily in the rural communities or even in some of those areas where you saw some of those pharmacies that are closed. So we still have a lot of people that don't have access. And so we're trying to really work closely to figure out the best way to be able to support access. Um, and this goes for many things. We talk a lot about access physically being closed, but even um, access as it relates to technology, how to schedule an appointment. If somebody has a disability, how do they physically go to one of these locations if they're you know, homebound or a wheelchair bound or have issues like that? So we really need to think about access. And then this is my last slide. This is where the COVID diagnoses have, have primarily occurred. And you can see in some of these darker areas, that's where you see a high concentration of COVID. So you also see that it's disproportionately affecting um, Black communities, and then also a lot of border health communities where we already experience a lot of health disparities. So I really, I can't stress enough to work um, closely with the resources that are available like the promotoras and pharmacists are ready to serve and ready to help um, with being able to do that. And we are trying to do that, uh, work collaboratively with the CDC to make sure that we produce um, vaccine confidence type of education uh, that's language supported, that's culturally sensitive, and that we can uh, really assist with. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, before we transition into our question and answer, um, I just wanted to ground us in um, some recent data um, dated uh, March 30th on COVID. So COVID-19 positive rates, this is all national data. Uh, about just over 9,000 per 100,000 positive cases. Um, the death rates are 164 per 100,000. Um, and this was announced, so we have 93,631,163 uh, individuals in this country who have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccinations, which is pretty phenomenal. Now of that data though, only 52.5% of that data has ethnicity or race connected to it. We don't know who the other, you know, something about half of those, um, those vaccinated, but we don't know what ethnic or racial groups the other 50% represent. So there's a lot of information missing there in terms of um, how we should allocate resources um, how we should determine strategies, who's being left out, who are we doing a good job of, you know, reaching with these vaccines. But so of that data that we have, the 52.5% um, with of data with ethnicity and race, we see that 9.2% um, of vaccinations are Hispanic Latino. And Let's see, so that was with one dose. Now, if we look at two doses, so fully vaccinated because we're not taking Johnson & Johnson into account here, um, 51,593,564 individuals in this country um, are fully vaccinated with both doses. Again, though, 53.5% of that data has any ethnicity or race collected on it. So we know kind of half the picture there when we're talking about racial and ethnic approaches to health. And of that data, 7.5% um, we know are Hispanic Latino. So given sort of that scenario, and um, yesterday I saw uh, there was a good article on March 29th yesterday in New York Times um, that talked about, it's entitled, What's Behind the Hispanic Vaccination Gap? And um, some of this data comes from Kaiser Family Foundation. And what struck me was that it said that Hispanic share of the vaccinated population is less than Hispanic general population in all states with large Hispanic communities. So New York Times analysis of state reported race and ethnicity information saw that uh, Hispanics and Latinos were underrepresented with vaccination across all states, <laughs> all states. Wow, there's a lot of work to do. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to ask these questions first of Berta and uh, Jessica. 
How is your community experiencing issues accessing the vaccine, if at all? Is this something you, you all are feeling on? Yesenia, you want to answer? Uh, yes, can you repeat the question one more time, please? I didn't get the last part. Sure. sure. How, is, how is your community experiencing issues accessing the vaccine, if at all? Perhaps there aren't any issues ac accessing the vaccine. Um, I would say that a lot of the community has reached out to me um, asking where can they get the vaccine. A lot of times um, they know that there are sites that they are from their state or from the county um, that are free, but a lot of clinics and pharmacies are charging. Uh, they do have some kind of cost. Um, and their concern is, well, it's all over the place that the vaccines are going to be free. Um, but a lot of times the way that the clinics explain to them, yeah, the vaccine itself is free, but just the fact of coming into the clinic or having to see a doctor or nurse before getting the vaccine, then there's going to be an out-of-pocket cost, and a lot of people don't have insurance, medical insurance. Yes, I, I'm, to piggyback on that, we did hear about that, and so, of course, you know, our, uh, our community of promotores, you know, we make sure that they inform their community, you don't have a cost. The vaccine is free. Now let's work with what is the other barrier? Is it transportation? Mm, is it, you know, uh, childcare? You know, um, you know, because now, yes, we are seeing more and more uh, sites, you know, that are offering the vaccine, but that doesn't mean there's sites that are like within a few miles distance. You know, they're pretty far away from some of these communities, some of the underserved communities. Um, so we need to see more, more groups, you know, coming into a community center, uh, a faith-based, you know, uh, building, churches, you know, where the community congregates. That needs to happen. Um, you know how, um, I know in our, an example, you know, at our uh, uh, church and community center, you know, when we want, you know, um, the community that doesn't go get the flu shot to get the flu shot, we bring the flu shot to them. <laughs> and, and it's made a huge difference, huge difference in the response um, and, and how they follow through. You know, because it's a place of comfort. It's it's a comforting. So if the school is a comfort zone, a comfortable zone area, uh, the community centers, um, whatever the 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 buildings are, the clinics within their in their communities, and that's where they need to get the vaccines to. It's that simple. Um, the the I think the zip code with the um, most that has not responded, I think it's an 85009 or 006 here in, uh, I'm talking about here in Phoenix, um, with the highest number, you know, that area has a huge number of homeless, okay? Our homeless population. And a lot of, and because of the pandemic, we have a lot of families with children that have become homeless. And they're filling up, you know, the St. Vincent de Paul centers and the, you know, um, the organizations, you know, that are providing shelter. So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to get that comfort zone that it, it's, it is not, you know, the, the positive answering their questions, actually, not assuming and not because, you know, we all have the honor and the uh, um, and the ability to share with each other information. We're learning from Sandra Lial today. We're learning from each other here. But many of our families, who are they learning from? We need to learn what their feelings and thoughts are. We need to ask more questions and so that we can address what their fears are and not just bombard with a flyer or or hey they're you know make an appointment we've got this number you know we're not asking enough questions so that we can then address the real issues 
Can I just add to Berta? You know, I think one of the reasons why we couldn't get out more to the community initially was just because of the storage precautions with the vaccine, especially when they first came out, they were uh, perceived to be very unstable. And so you needed like deep refrigeration. And now with new additions of vaccine and with more information, we know the stability is better, which is then hopefully going to allow for some of the traditional things that you're talking about, Berta, going out and providing the vaccine where people go instead of expecting people to come in. So I, I think that's going to start getting better as we know more information. And we have seen that um, that there's been new uh, guidance that like the Pfizer vaccine doesn't have to have as, as deep a storage as it as before. Like the people were trying to buy these really expensive refrigerators to yeah. store them, but that's not the case anymore. So we're starting to see some of that improve and, and hopefully access uh, will happen as a result of some of this, this new information. So um, I just also wanna share how important it is to share your experience. I think Bertha, you talked about when you when you receive the vaccine and and then a month later and you experience um, no side effects, that's really good. I ended up participating in the Moderna study last year, like um, September October, and then I got the placebo, and then I actually got my first dose the last day of last year, so December thirty first. And I've been sharing that experience with a lot of people just to tell them, you know, I feel very comfortable in participating. I shared it with my mom. I consider my mom the promotora now and. Nogales because she uh, she gets all the calls from all the family, the community, and then she she calls me so I can answer the questions. And so she's the vector for information. So it's amazing how that is because people trust you and because they know you and because, you know, if you've done it and they feel comfortable that you're willing to do it, then it, it speaks volumes about um, whether or not somebody's willing to take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also got the Moderna and, and after e either dose, no symptoms. My daughter who's 30 uh, and a, uh, she's in remission from cancer, she received the Pfizer and also no symptoms, no side effects, nothing. Yeah, I just so had a the, really a, a dull headache and, and the, the sore arm, but that was it. So not, yeah. not significant. And it goes away pretty quickly, which is good. Even, even if you, you get stuff, it's typically a couple of days, you're good to go. Before we dip more into uh, vaccines and vaccine effects, um, I just wanted to circle back to this conversation a little bit. Um, we have a couple of questions on the chat, but we talked about some of those issues accessing the vaccine um, from, you know, trust, issues of trust, misinformation, disinformation, really basic things that we've been continue to still deal with. I just can't believe we're still dealing with, you know, transportation and childcare, like, don't we know that already? <laughs> Um, well, what's being done? Um, how are these issues being addressed? Um, Berta, beforehand, you were uh, talking to us a little bit about a phone line, for example. Um, can you speak to, I'll, I invite all three panelists, um, but maybe Berta can go first just to talk a little bit about how are people getting creative, the health departments, the community health centers and others um, to address the access issues? Well, you know, um, I've had several organizations that have reached out, you know, to the HOPE Network um, in order to tap in or to uh, access, you know, community health workers, promotoras, promotores, to help them in the process of answering questions from the community. Um, we were recently invited, you know, uh, to, in a collaboration with Maricopa County Department of Public Health and CRN, which is the Crisis Response Network, or the 211. You know, the, the goal is to be able to open up a, uh, a phone center, you know, manned by promotores, manned by uh, uh, bilingual promotores, but specifically to serve the calls mm, of limited English to monolingual Spanish speaking uh, older adults. Um, which have also, this is a, a you know, a, a population, a group that, you know, they are not going, they don't have internet, they, they have no desire to have internet, and they don't want anything to do with a computer. These are older, you know, are older and, and um, uh, it, uh, you know, community of older adults, and, you know, the simpler the better. So, you know, we've been, uh, 
collaborating and we were able to, you know, connect them with, you know, a large number of promotores that are bilingual and that are going through training specifically on the on COVID testing and on vaccines so that when they answer these calls, uh, they're able to, they're comfortable and they're well informed uh, to to help the older adults, you know, with their questions. And if, you know, they're calling and saying, I'd like an appointment, then they're going to be trained and in a position. And I think um, Yesenia can probably speak uh, more in depth as to their role, um, but even schedule appointments from what I understand, because, you know, it, it's been difficult for the much, I don't know about you all, but when I first started to try to get an appointment, excuse me, and I think I'm a little tech savvy, <laughs> I, it was frustrating. I went in circles. Um, you know, it was like my grandson says, Nana, Nana, just type in another zip code and see what happens. And bam, I typed in another zip code. Well, if it's asking me for my zip code, why do I have to type in other zip codes? It was weird. It was bizarre. It was a little, that was a little stressful. So can you imagine, you know, our population, you know, our community members, older adults, and even, you know, just in general, that are not tech savvy, don't want to be, you know, to get an appointment. So... I think it's better now. I understand. I don't know because I don't need to make an appointment, <laughs> but I've been told that it's better. So I think that we need to, you know, all what we do is focus to our community and our network of promotores. Please ask questions, ask questions so that we can address how to, um, how to get answers and get some, you know, action here, you know, a response from our community. So, you know, right now, you know, those questions are vital so that we can then bridge that gap and fill in and provide answers. Um, Yesenia, uh, Yesenia, you want to talk a little bit about what your role is going to be in on that phone line to answer questions on COVID and vaccines? Yeah, um, actually, my role over at the 211 CRN is actually a lead, um, a group lead. So at this point, what we're doing, we are taking the phone calls. We get a lot of questions. Um, unfortunately, people just know that the vaccine's out there. Um, but other than that, they don't even know where they could get it, what's the time frame in between the two vaccines, what the difference are. Um, like Bertha was saying, it's really important to get the facts out there to the community. Um, we do go ahead and assist them, um, yeah, depending on their area. A lot of times, it, if entering that different zip code or if they want to go, um, they want to drive a little bit further out, we're able to go ahead and get them the vaccines um, a little bit quicker without them having to wait so long. Because I know a lot of clinics right now are actually doing the waiting list, but they are going all the way till June for the waiting list. And that was a few days ago. Wow. Thank I you. Um, I wanted to, I don't know if you're familiar, but the CDC put a really nice vaccine finder. I put it on the, I don't know if you can share it, but you know, one of the questions that we're receiving a lot is that people wanting a specific kind of vaccine. And with this link that the CDC put out, you could actually filter and pick the vaccine that you want. And then it puts in the zip code and it'll tell you which locations have it available. And right now it is, it's kind of hard because once they opened um, the adult population, the a few appointments that there were got filled immediately, but there's more supply coming in the next few weeks uh, and hopefully more appointments will become available. But, but at least from that filtering perspective, you can pick the vaccine that you're looking for, your zip code, and it'll tell you if there's an appointment available or not. But it's been, it's been challenging. And I agree with you, uh, Berta, that the, it's been very geared to people that have access to technology. And it has not been accommodating to people that don't have access. Uh, I tried to sign my mom up. She lives in, in Nogales. And it took me registering her with a state, verifying the code, re-logging in, logging in again. I think it took me three times to go through the process. And then when I finally got through, there were no appointments. Um, that That's frustrating because you've just spent all this time and then to not. And then by the time you want to check again the next day, you know, do you even remember all the passwords that you tried to use? That's, again, very stressful. Um, 
and I've gone through and, and actually gone into the different types of pharmacies because different pharmacies have different ways to uh, register. Some of them are significantly easier than others, but regardless, you still need technology or um, you have to have the patience or the time to sit there and pick up a phone and wait for somebody to respond if there's even the ability for somebody to answer. So those are luxuries we think we have, but if you work, and you have to be at work and they don't let you sit around and, and wait for uh, somebody to respond to a call for an hour, that's not something that's easy and accessible. So we have to figure out different ways to get access to people. Yeah, I just saw something in the chat, you know, uh, in Connecticut, is it? Uh, someone shared, yeah, in Hartford, that they're gonna start offering the vaccine in Walmart. No, we're talking, you know, here in, in Arizona, here in Phoenix, hey, in the ranch market. You know, ranch markets are all over, all over the state of Arizona. You know, there's a whole community of, you know, uh, that's what you got to do. You got to mm -hmm. think outside of the box. Go mm -hmm. to ranch markets, go to food cities. Food cities are all over. Go to the Walmart and, and uh, they will be more than happy to, you know, accommodate a space, a table, you know, whatever is going to help. Because this is when you're going to be able to get them, you know, uh, to at least consider it. And if it's there, by golly, they're going to do it. And the other uh, uh, thing I'm seeing in the chat is what methods are you using to get the education out to individuals? Get the education out to individuals. Oh, I'm hearing myself. I sound terrible. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, the education, you know, that's getting out. I mean, the State Department of, of, of Health, all of the organizations are putting out promotional, you know, um, flyers and, and door hangers and, you know, in English and Spanish and very colorful. There's a lot of uh, a live Facebook media talking about it. Uh, the co you know the uh, talking about covid and the vaccine but it's not enough i'm sorry i say it's not enough um and you know and sometimes i you know it's money my mother decía con dinero baila el chango pues sí you know media you know how expensive media is and if there's no money if they're not getting money you know es que no no quieren bailar los changuitos um so uh the other thing i'm seeing here in the um chat is that, you know, about collaborating with the fire department, you know, all of our first responders and the fire department, you know, any collaboration, you know, you start, you know, at, uh, you start with a meeting of the minds, you start with reaching out, you know, connecting with, you know, first responders, connecting with, you know, the community of promotores or, or, um, you know, uh, and, and, and just coming together. I mean, you just gotta make it happen. Make it happen. Just reach out, have a meeting, have a collaboration. If it can't be in person, then virtually, you know, and talk about what do we wanna see happen here with our collaboration. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We have plenty, plenty of talented groups and organizations and professionals and promotores, community health workers and such that we can we can come together to make it happen. Absolutely. There's a question about um, vaccine hesitancy. And there's a, a, a narrative there that um, a lot of, you know, communities of color, people of color um, don't want to get, they're hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, but what we're seeing though, while that exists, what we're seeing though is um, there are a lot of people who are eager to get the vaccine. But when we think about those who are hesitant to get the vaccine, um, what are some recommendations that you have in terms of communicating uh, to folks who have some questions uh, about the vaccine to provide them the information they need and help them make the decision for themselves as to whether it's the right thing for them to do? You know, from our perspective, when we're working with patients in a pharmacy or with our telehealth model where we're reviewing uh, medications, a lot of times it's just simply listening to the concerns that people have and validating what those concerns are, not being judgmental, uh, but really trying to get to the core of understanding about what they, what they wanna know. Because a lot of times it's just that they need information um, and they need 
you know, answers before they would make a decision. It doesn't mean that they're never going to take it, but maybe today that they're not ready at this moment. Um, so it might take a couple of tries or, you know, making sure you get that information. But I think the biggest thing is to not be judgmental, just listen to the concerns, acknowledge what those are, and then, um, you know, and, 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 and create that trust. Because at the end of the day, it's whether they trust you or not, uh, whether they take wh where they're going to take it or not. Um, and, you know, and some people just take a little bit longer to get there. And sometimes they never want it. And that's okay, too. Uh, but hopefully, you know, hopefully with more information, we've seen that that hesitancy decrease, especially as more people have come and taken it. And we're seeing a lot of social media where people are posting pictures and they're sharing their experience. Um, they're sharing side effects, which is expected because now people are sharing it. But most people come back and say, oh, it wasn't that bad. It was worth it. And and then the positive things, you can start seeing your families again and things like that. I think those are going to be big motivators um, for people to, to take it. People want to get back to you no know, semblance of normal, send their kids back to school. So hopefully um, some of those things will start improving. But we will we will always have a little bit of, of, of hesitancy. It's just a matter of overcoming a, a group, at least enough to create that herd immunity that we need. Thank you. Yeah, Was it's like story? Sandra, I'm sorry, it's like Sandra mm -hmm. said, key word, man, confidence. They trust what you're saying. And the more consistent we are with the same message over and over and over again, that's how it's going to, you know, make a big difference. We have to be consistent, repeat the same information. It, look, I know another issue we addressed at our last quarterly meeting was the masks. To wear or not to wear? To double up or triple up? Cloth or not? We've heard it all. <laughs> the community has, you know, I've had people say, <laughs> promotoras say, hey, our community is confused. Um, in the morning on a news, they heard Dr. Fushi, Fauci, what's his name? They, <laughs> Fauci, they heard him talk about masks and his recommendations. And then in the afternoon on Telemundo or Televisa, they heard another doctor, you know, talk about that you, you should be wearing three, you know, so, and that it, it's very confusing to the community. And you know what they say, you know, olvídate, no voy a hacer nada. If they're hearing, if, I mean, they're going to say, forget it. That I don't know who, who to believe. Now, the other, the other side of this, you know, Sandra also talked about the people of color, you know, you know, all being uh, who's who are not going through and who have said publicly on many, uh, you know, uh, at different interviews that they're not going to do it. And you know what? Because they don't trust. They don't trust the system. They this is, you know, from past experiences, from past generations past. Um, you know, um, where they were misguided, misinformed, and betrayed. That actually came to light, we, you know, recently. Because how can we trust when we've been betrayed and lied to and taken advantage of in the past? So, you know, it's, it's all about creating that open dialogue, not judging, like Sandra said, hearing, listening, and, and, and maybe, and, you know, providing information, establishing a relationship of trust so that we can then provide ongoing information and, and hope and pray that it's the same message, that it's the same message and not multiple, because that's even more confusing on top of everything else. Well said, Bertha. Um, someone just posted, they're seeing a lot of frustrated communities with concern about who to listen to. There's just too much information anymore. Yeah, and we've looked at the, you know, I've looked at some recent data and they, they, they really come back to who you should be listening to. And a lot of it is really the people they trust, right? It's the your provider, it's your pharmacist, it's who you trust, it's your neighbor, it's your promotora. And some of the least trusted are celebrities because they they don't know you, they're not like you. so. When they looked at the data, it really goes back to that trust factor and and uh, who you know and who you rely on. And so I think that's who we should probably be sticking to, the people that we trust. And hopefully we're all getting good information. But it has been very confusing. There's been politics involved, and that's caused a lot of dysfunction. And, and just being able to manage a public health 
uh, concerns. So, we, you know, I think if we think about that and put people first, that we could hopefully overcome some of the misinformation that's been shared. Yeah, that certainly hasn't helped. Um, there's someone who's asking to, so just a little bit of an educational teaching moment here, um, to please give us an example of what you specifically communicate to a person who does not trust the vaccine. So again, kind of embodying those um, values that you mentioned, you know, non-judgmental, listening deeply, you know, some of these things with someone like from the panel uh, to just offer some, uh, an example of how you would communicate to a person I, who doesn't trust the vaccine? Yes, I personally have, have you know, had several different family, family members, friends, and newly, you know, community members that I don't know who have communicated their distrust. And again, you know, if they're distrusting and they're, you know, all I, all I did was share my own personal experience. And then it opened up the door in some cases of communication. Well, how did you, what did you know and why? How could you trust? What was your reason mean? You know, how did you get to that place? where you're not distrusting, you're not afraid, you know, of the of this government conspiracy, you're not afraid that uh, of what's in it. And so I would answer their questions. Well, this is the information I collected. This is what I read. This is what I listened to. And that's how I came to the decision to get vaccinated so when they're distrusting and they're you know it looks like their mind is made up if you're willing to um you know uh, answer their specific questions to the best of your ability honestly and and it's not you know in a way that you're trying to convince them you're just sharing your own well this is what i thought about and I ask questions and I talk to so-and-so and I, you know, and, and that's how I came to make my choice. And, um, and they're, they're more willing to, you know, to, they're listening. They will listen, but we have to respectfully, you know, validate their fear, their, their, um, their frustrations, their, their, um, confusion <laughs> you know it, you, we have to validate it and we may leave that conversation and we didn't convince them but it's not about convincing them it's about being an as honest and as um you know patient and not non-judgmental as possible because we hope and pray that something we said is going to stick and when they go away, they're going to think about that. I actually had one uh, family member that heard we had a discussion about it. Nobody got upset. About a week later, he called and said, I want you to know I went and got my first dose. And the reason, you know, our conversation helped me to get there. So that's what we need to do. Awesome. I wanted to invite Yesenia and uh, Sandra, if you also have any tips for how to communicate um, to somebody who has some doubts about the vaccine. Um, yeah, you know what, it's, it's funny because just last night I had a call from a member from the community. It was She was just freaking out. She said she had her first dose about a week ago and she was now starting to feel really tired and, and something wasn't going normal. Um, well, the first thing we do, of course, you want to recommend them to their PCP. You want to make sure that everything looks good. But of course, also refer them to like the uh, website, you know, for the Department of Health where they could go ahead and research more information and be aware of, you know, of any red flags in case, you know, anything's going on with the vaccine. But 
her thought was, well, oh my God, what if it is true what they say after six months, I'm going to pass to, to get in the vaccine, you know, and unfortunately we do hear a lot of things and they don't know who to believe and who not to believe. Um, that's why it's really important to go ahead and give them the facts in, and, and like Berta said, you know, share our personal stories with them. You know, if we've been va uh, vaccinated, let them know how we felt, you know, and that could bring some comfort to them and make them know that it's okay. You know, you're going to bypass that stage. You know, it's probably part of the vaccine or simply, you know, if you've been having really crazy days more than the usual, then yeah, of course, you're going to be a little bit tired. Um, but of course, always go ahead and uh, refer them also to their PCP because of course, we're not doctors or nurses. We can't determine what's exactly going on, but we do want to go ahead and listen to what they have to say and bring a little bit of comfort to them. You know, one of the best tools that I've used is I actually, I take a picture of myself getting vaccinated. I took a picture of my mom getting vaccinated. I took a picture of my daughter getting vaccinated because there's been concerns in younger, she's 17 and I posted it on social media. And I can tell you that was like a major, um, in, I would say incentive trust factor again, because if I put my money where my mouth is and like I getting my mom vaccinated and my, and my daughter vaccinated, that really was a, a place where a lot of questions came and a lot of people that were afraid were like, oh, you, your mom got it, that's great. They called her, they asked her how she felt. They contacted me about, how, you know, how Soli, how, how's she doing, is she okay? And just to be able to like walk them through that and know that, you know, if I have enough comfort in doing that, um, that they felt that they feel more comfortable doing it too. And I think where I was, um, I did the study and I was even myself concerned when I first participated in the study. I'm like, should I do this? Should I not do this? It's in study mode. Uh, but I felt like there's not a lot of representation of, of, of you know, diversity in studies. Historically, they've been very uh, homogeneous. They haven't had a lot of a diverse population. So I really wanted to participate in the study just to make sure that it represented the communities that were going to vaccinate. And I know Tucson was here in Tucson we had a vaccination site and they were able to recruit some of the most um, diverse uh, set of, of study participants to, to give comfort that the vaccine was being studied in a variety of people and, and internationally too, because obviously this is not just here in the United States, all over the world. Uh, but even to share that experience and how that went and how all the things I had to do to report and how they monitored us for safety, all of those experiences are, are things that I shared to just give people uh, comfort in knowing that it's not, you know, I've already been vaccinated for a while. And so the more time that passes and more, um, the, you know, nothing's happened. Not to say that it's, it's a hundred percent scot-free, but I think it's just, again, putting yourself out there and sharing your experiences that really speaks a lot to, to those that are concerned. Sandra, I echo on one of the posts here that says, thank you for participating in the study. Um, that, that went a long way, especially when you were saying about about the um, the diversity from two so I didn't realize that 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 is it goes a long way because you know someone says well who was this who were in the study I mean those folks who have sort of that knowledge around studies and what makes a study valid you know well, well who were these people and um, who say oh you know there were so many Latinos and you know blacks etc then okay okay so then this was also with me in mind great um, I just want to give a reminder to all of us. Um, our interpreter, Mariana, is working hard to keep up with us. And, uh, and he's all caught up. Um, so why don't we, there was one question. Um, when I was reading that, sharing that data, the national vaccination data, um, and we talked about how half of the data didn't have race or ethnicity connected to that. Sandra, do you have um, insight to share around that? Why aren't we seeing 100% or, you know, just more data reported with ethnicity? So um, I know, f at least for the pharmacy community, a lot of the pharmacy systems where we used to do vaccines and dispense didn't, didn't actually have the ability to even collect that information. So what's happened in the last few months is that a lot of those systems have actually had to be programmed to even to even be able to collect those fields. And so we hadn't been collecting it for like previous vaccines that we were given. And, but this is such a critical, you know, basically federal mandate to collect it that now there's that retroactive look at being able to collect and report it, which is really positive. And then just in general, um, making sure providers ask the information. Sometimes we make assumptions about who we're giving vaccines to or the field isn't filled out, it's there, but we don't even complete it. 
for a number of reasons, but now there's even been a push to try to get providers to ask the information and then to document it so that we can start filling in those gaps. Because I just think we were kind of all over the place trying to get the information on the on COVID itself and treating it um, that uh, we hadn't gotten to that place of being able to collect and report it, but it's getting better. There's more work being done to do that. There's attention to it. Um, I know that I've been in conversations um, with a, with the feds, different groups now that are trying to like work on uh, on some solutions to be able to address that and and start uh, putting priority to that because it's very critical priority. Because with that, once we know if there's gaps or if there's information um, about populations that we're not serving, we can then create targeted programs, targeted education, you know, specific outreaches that we would uh, be more informed with if we had that information. Thank you. And so let's get into the technical questions here around vaccines. Uh, is COVID-19 vaccine a treatment for COVID-19? So a lot of these are for Sandra. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not a, it's hopefully to prevent from getting it, right? Like, so the COVID vaccine is supposed to create immunity so that you don't get infected from COVID. Um, now, so it, and one of the things I just, I was just reading it this morning. So a lot of this is new. This is a novel coronavirus, which means it's new to everybody. So information we share today can literally change tomorrow because we're getting more information. And especially as more people are getting vaccinated. But one of the things that we're seeing, like when people have talked about long COVID, which is, you know, people that got sick and now they have these symptoms that just continue. They're seeing that if people receive the vaccine, that they're actually seeing an improvement Improvement in some symptoms to some degree. So it's not curing it or, or making it, well, it is making it better, but it's not that it's for treatment of it, but we see that the body can then now potentially um, benefit from the vaccine and, and, and start minimizing some of those symptoms of long COVID. But the goal of, that, of the vaccine is to prevent from getting sick, or if you get sick, because it's not 100%, uh, but to get it to a lesser degree so that you don't end up in a hospital situation or dead. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's very, it's showing a lot of effectiveness. And even yesterday, um, they actually showed some studies, some outcomes that are showing that it's even more effective out in the real world than even in the trials. And it, in the vaccines that they were showing that after two weeks of getting vaccinated, some of the reports yesterday that came out is that it's showing that after two weeks of the vaccine, the first dose, you're seeing up to an 80% protection with it. And then that second dose for those that require a second dose are really boosting you up over 90, 95%. So it's really been shown to be effective so far. So that's very, very promising. Thank you. And should we have any concerns about how quickly the vaccine was developed with Operation Warp Speed? So, you know, this was, a, again, a very important question, and I had the same concern. I'm like, that's incredible. But, you know, when you actually look and think about what happened, the whole world stopped focusing on so many other things and then just immediately concentrated around this priority. Like, you had scientists all over the world. And I know I have friends that literally work in labs here at the university. They're like, they made us stop working on everything we're working on to focus on COVID. So what happened is they did not skip any steps. What they were able to do is actually work on different steps simultaneously. So in parallel, things that what you would might start, like this phase will take this amount, and then this phase this amount, and then this phase this amount. You usually start with one, then the other, then the other. What they did is they started them at the same time. So they didn't skip any steps. They just started them all together. And what was really interesting too, usually, trials of any kind, but vaccine trials, it takes a while to recruit enough people to show the safety, the efficacy and all of that. But because there were so many people getting infected, they were able to hit the study um, enrollment much quicker. So they were able to enroll the 30 to 40 to 50,000 um, participants quicker because we had a pandemic happening. So we were able to get to some of those points and enrollments quicker just because we had so many people experiencing it. So, so nothing was skipped. It was just paralleled you know, and then um, everything was reviewed. And I even participated in some of the um, FDA reviews where they had panels of like these incredible people out like from different institutions that came together, reviewed the data. It was several days, questions. I mean, it was phenomenal to see all of the people coming together. And, and you might've seen that even just recently, the AstraZeneca, there was a concern about its data. 
that shows that there's a process that's working. They actually found that there was something that needed to be corrected and they proved that that that, that process is working and they ended up fixing it and showing that instead of 70, I think it was 79% effective, it was 76% effective. But that was a challenge to, to that, to, to show that they're really reviewing the data to try to correct anything and try to make sure that they're giving the most uh, accurate information. So I think all of those things put together all of the attention, the whole world focusing and stopping and working on this, you just took everybody's energy and spirit and then made it happen in that period of time because you had a dedicated effort. That's what it can look like when we all work together, right? And no, no shortcuts, like you were saying. Exactly. Thank you also for the AstraZeneca, uh, you know, in terms of like, that's a good news story as far as how the system is working. Um, I definitely appreciate that. And, um, there's a, a little bit of a chat going back to uh, how do we address that misinformation or the lies when we don't have the health workforce. And I know Justenia had pointed out, you know, point them to maybe people don't trust, you know, the um, government websites or government sources, but they trust us. But if that, they listen to her or listen to someone like her and she's saying, go, here's good, credible information, then, that's that's a way to expand that workforce, right? It just be hearing it from you that that's where you go to to get the information is a way to then maybe be more open to trusting that information. Are there other um, suggestions that Jusenia or Berta or Sandra um, would like to add um, yeah, when I... you find yourself in a place where the workforce is so small, we don't have an army of promotores or other trusted advocates how do we multiply the good information? Well, I think that I answered, I was uh, chatting with Priscilla and, um, you know, she, uh, she said, uh, you know, because I wanted to know, did we answer any of, you know, your questions and, and comments? And again, you know, she stated how, how do they answer the questions of the community and provide the appro appropriate, you know, credible messaging when, they don't have the workforce. I think she's in Yuma, um, you know, and you know, we ha again, we have to be very creative and think outside of the box. You know, um, I told her tap into your local businesses that are frequented, you know, uh, las carnicerías, las panaderías, pozolerías, you know, we're talking about all these community based businesses that cater to the community that's not listening or is very uh, renuentes, you know, están renuentes, you know, no, no confío en nada de eso. Um, tap into those businesses and let them know, hey, you know, tenemos valuable, tenemos información valiosa, you know, que compartir con tus, con tus clientes, nos permites una mesita, una esquina, un tiempo aquí. Most of them, you know, are willing to do that. They will be more than willing to participate. Also, your media, you know, who, who are the media contacts? You know, the TV, the radio, the newspapers. There's lots of free, you know, estos magazines, you know, que están en las esquinas, you know, on the corner streets, uh, you know, that can post something. Um, uh, you know, and, and other stores, you know, that are frequented, you know, businesses that are, you know, uh, again, your food cities and your ranch markets and your Walmarts and your Tart or whoever, you know, um, and in order to be able to share and, 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 and as well as get input, because not only do you want them to take the flyer, they might just toss it down in the corner there, but you want to say to them, what, what is keeping you from getting your vaccine? You know, que es lo que, en, you know, lo, lo detiene de, de tomar la vacuna. You know, me interesa mucho porque, mira, we always get good data. I know we get good data from our community. You know why? Because I remind them over and over again, tu voz, tu opinión vale oro. Your voice, your opinion, your input is worth gold. How can we create or better serve you, your family, the community, if we don't know what you need from us? 
you know, so we need to remind the community, tu voto, tu voz, tu opinión vale oro para hacer cambios positivos, you know, so we need to, to remember that when we're talking to the community and tell them you're, you know, tu, mis respetos, tu opinión es muy importante para mí. Now, the other side of that is our faith-based organizations. Our faith-based organizations, they're, they're huge. Why are we not tapping in more? What is the holdup? What is the barrier? Yes, I know there are restrictions in place, and but, but we still have faith-based organizations, you know, that have, uh, how do you, what do you call those, uh, classrooms or, or your social, you know, the kitchens, the cafeterias, you know, nobody's using them and they're big spaces, you know, and, and these are uh, uh, opportunities to social distance, but to have a community, uh, city hall or a community event or meeting or bring in the vaccines. You know, so we've got to tap in to the faith-based groups, in my opinion. And so um, also um, the watch, you know, block watch groups, any kind of group. Um, the other thing that recently um, there are more and more uh, teams and groups of sports coming together. Soccer is humongous. I mean, uh, you know, throughout this whole pandemic, pandemic, I remember going through parks and there was huge, you know, uh, people gathered out in the parks and the soccer fields. That's prime target right there. I see it as a prime time to share and, and flyers information to talk, you know, in between whatever. So uh, the sports world is getting back and they're anxiously getting back. You know, so that's another, you know, group of people that we are missing. I hear you, Becca. What I hear is we go to these folks who are not the usual suspects. They're not the, you know, public health people. We connect them with that credible information and they're, you know, thought leaders and influencers from the sacerdote to the padre to the, you know, to the uh, baseball hero and um, that consistent messaging. What I'm going to do is our uh, time is growing near here um, for us to wrap up. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to provide some closing comments. Um, and I'd like to start with Yesenia. Like how I always tell my community, if you guys have any questions or concern, um, let it out. Speak to someone. No se queden callado que su voz cuenta, como dijo la señora Berta. We're here to help you out, guide you, and give you more uh, resources and information as needed. Great. And anything else about the COVID vaccine or anything um, specific to that um, that you'd like to people to, to walk away with? Um, I would say for a lot of those people that, that have not been able to schedule their vaccine, um, don't give up. Keep trying. I know that a lot of sites will, will be uh, opening new um, appointments um, in the upcoming days, weeks, um, and just if that's something that you want to do, just go for it, you know, get all the information that you need and, and start protecting yourself and others at the same time. Thank you. Sandra, closing remarks or points yeah. you want people to walk away with? I hope people have a little bit more confidence in the vaccine. So definitely um, that's the point of this, right? To make sure that you feel like you can go to somewhere to answer your questions and that you can get the vaccine. I know just as a pharmacist, pharmacists are there, they're, they're absolutely excited to be part of the solution to help provide access and reach. Um, that's very critical. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm hoping that next time we can do this face-to-face, -face, that's the goal of all of this, that we can actually overcome this pandemic and uh, move on to addressing other things, other things that we've been dealing with historically that we can now address in the future. But it's been a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I can't say, say enough how important your promotoras are very, very important resource in your community. Thank you. And anything you'd like to say about the role of pharmacists and uh, that they're playing during this pandemic and with the Absolutely, vaccine. yep. So pharmacists, not just for the COVID vaccine, but they've been there for, um, you know, to provide vaccines for, for 
flu shot every year and now more vaccine opportunities. So it's just a quick access point. We work really closely with your providers uh, to communicate information back to your doctors, to advocate for you, to help you with um, medication access and disease management. My specialty is actually in diabetes. I'm a certified diabetes educator and that was what I did before my current position. And so I know pharmacists play a big role in chronic care management um, and, and just being out there as a resource that you can walk into any day, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes 24 seven, there's a pharmacist there to help you. So just remember that if you ever feel like you don't have information, walk into a pharmacy and ask for the pharmacist and hopefully they can help you out. It's a very, very good access point uh, to just remember that and keep in mind. Thank you, Sandra. Berta? Um, <laughs> hey, you know, we've shared a lot of information. I was just going to send a, a, a message to everybody. You know, it's these kinds of, you know, uh, meetings and, uh, you know, discussions, you know, that, that help all of us get empowered and reinforce and recharge the battery because it's a little stressful. Okay, this whole thing, the whole year, and we've all experienced loss. Um, we've experienced, you know, some hot, um, lots of challenges. So, and this is this is another one. It's an ongoing challenge, but we need to stay positive. We need to stay, you know, uh, focused. You know, keep your eye on the target. You know, which is to inform, educate and be able to bridge that gap between our community and, and, and our health world, our, the vaccine and all the information that's going to just put us all in a better place. But the promotores, you know, mis, mis respetos, because as promotores, you know, we don't wait for the information or for uh, the resources to fall down from the skies. We go out, and we research and we regroup and we're always, my daughters don't like to go to the store with me because they say, mom, you're going to speak with every caregiver that you see in the store, or you're going to go talk to them about this or that or the other. We're, they don't like going with me anywhere. But that's what it's about. Vas a la clinica, vas al doctor, you're going to, those are all opportunities. Grocery stores, shopping. Somebody said, uh, somebody in the chat said, talk to your nail techs, your hair, <laughs> you know, help them help you spread the word. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Berta. Um, it's been a pleasure for myself also to, to share this space and this time with um, our experts. And, um, I hear, you know, a lot of passion. I hear a lot of ganas. I, um, I know they've been working hard even before the pandemic. There's, there's a passion and a love for la gente, you know, nuestra comunidad. And um, it just shines through right now. Um, and, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Si se puede, we can get there. If we just keep continuing to work together, amazing people like this across, you know, across space and time and our different sectors and industries and, you know, areas that we come from. Um, I want to ask Marta if you have any final words that you'd like to share um, before we wrap up here. I just want to thank everybody. I just love listening to everyone. Um, you inspire me and keep me going. So, um, no, I just thank everyone for, for sharing the information and hope we can continue the conversation. And thanks on behalf of all our partners, um, the NRC, the, our Melanie and Zuckman College of Public Health, um, the Arizona American Pharmacists Association, the Hope Network, um, and of course, um, Arizona Telemedicine um, as well for, for hosting us. So thank you. Thank you to our interpreter, Mariana. And uh, I want to uh, just point out there's an evaluation link, if you could kindly, we, we finished a little early, so that um, give you a little time to give your feedback. We just wanna make this as useful and as helpful, um, informative to you each time we do this. So please take a moment to fill out that evaluation. And I'm just 
scrubbing the chat one more time to uh, <laughs> make sure I, I catch all this. Wonderful. Well, we're seeing some uh, some good positive positive remarks and comments. So thank you to everyone. I know we're all very busy and stretched. Si se puede. Have a good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs>